Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Again, I'd like to thank the organizer for inviting me over from Hong Kong. It's a great pleasure to speak to you guys, I mean, to share with you some of the things which I've done uh, in the past 15 years when I was in, uh, uh, when I was and I'm still in Hong Kong. Okay, um, well, we have started working on uh, nanofibers in 2005, and there are three areas in which we focus our effort on. One is on environment, and the other one is on energy. The third one is on health. Today, I'd like to speak mainly um, the E and E part, okay? Um, again, i just break it down into a couple of areas. In the energy, I'd like to speak about the solar cells. I'll be talking about two types of solar cells. In the environment, we talk about aerosols. And then um, in, under the aerosols, I divide into the light part, light loading, and also heavy loading, because they are somewhat different, uh, as you will see later on. And also, I will be talking about removal of harmful gas in the air, and also removal of uh, contaminants. These are dissolved organics in the water. OK, what are nanofibers? By definition, fiber diameter less than 1,000 nanometers, or what we call one micron. And as far as lengthwise is concerned, um, it can vary anywhere from microns to millimeters or even longer. And as far as um, materials are concerned, you can make it from organics, polymeric, uh, inorganic, and also natural materials. And then application is quite wide. Um, energy, environment, health, sensing, et cetera, et cetera. But today, I would like to focus on the energy and environmental side. Now, well, there are two ways of making nanofibers. One is in molten form, and it's the other way in which I'm making it. You take a material in which you want to make nanofibers, you find a solvent, you dissolve that into the solvent, and make it into a very so-called viscous solution. How viscous is viscous? Like honey-like, okay? And afterwards, you put it into a syringe, and the syringe is charged at very high voltage. And then on the other side, you have a collector, either ground it or put a negative voltage to it. Now, you set a very strong electric field, but very low current. And then as you start oozing out a small part of material in there, uh, what it leaves the needle is on the order of millimeters. But now, once like, um, the strong electrical field can overcome the surface tension of the liquid, you start having a jet going out, which we call the Taylor instability. Now, that jet is not nanofibers. It's on the order of millimeters. But um, as it travels uh, to the collector, there are two things that make it uh, thinner. Number one is evaporation of the solvent. Okay, very important. So the humidity affects the nanofibers. The second thing is because um, when the jet is being uh, um, uh, evolved, you have uh, charges deposited onto um, the jet itself. And then uh, the repulsion of the light charges would basically elongate the fiber by repulsion and make it into nanofibers. So these two mechanisms are major mechanisms uh, to uh, thin out the fibers. By the time when it get collected there, you'll be able to see uh, nanofibers less than 1,000 nanometers. Now, using a one single uh, needle, it takes a long time okay, uh, to make a nanofiber mat. Okay? My student can spend 24 hours on this. But later on, we basically use many, many jets, what we call a needleless machine. Essentially, the phenomenon is very similar. Uh, again, you can lay a very thin film of liquid onto the surface. Okay? Um, as the film becomes very thin, and also the electrical force is large, you can reduce basically the surface tension force so that you can um, uh, instigate many, many jets uh, coming out from uh, the single source. So this is the basis of the needleless electrode spinning machine, and this can basically produce large, larger quantities of nanofibers. So we have both of those units in, uh, uh, in our lab. In fact, our needleless machine was the first needleless machine in China. Today, there are many, many machines in China. This was the first machine um, imported um, or actually purchased okay, in 2009. Now it becomes an antique. OK, to, uh, right now I'd like to talk about the solar energy. In the solar, solar energy, I'd like to talk about uh, dye-sensitized solar cells. It's actually a very pretty uh, cell. You do not need to put it on the ground floor. You can put it on windows because it's semi-transparent. It's also colorful. Okay? So it makes a big difference because now you don't have to worry about uh, land usage. Well, 
it has a quite a number of uh, uh, flexibility because it's, it's uh, almost a mimic uh, photosynthesis. Okay, uh, it's flexible and, and all kinds of good beauty. Now, one of the things to measure um, the performance of that is what, what is known as power conversion efficiency. It's essentially the power output to the power input. The power output depends on three things. The first is like um, the current under short circuit condition we call JSC. And the other one is the voltage under open circuit condition we call the VOC. And after it's the fuel factor. The fuel factor measures the recombination. You want this to be as large as possible. Otherwise, if it's small, then that means recombination of electrons with uh, the so-called holes becomes important. And that would eat your lunch. So you want these three quantities to be large. Now, the way how a dye-sense dye solar cell works is very simple. Essentially, you take a very small more organic molecule of dye and attach to um, the TiO2 nanoparticles, about 20 nanometers. And then it harvests the light, it converts very effectively. Uh, essentially, uh, the dye would become so-called energized. And when it's in the energized state, uh, it would eject uh, or inject an electron to the conduction band of the TiO2. And the electron would travel from one particle to the next all the way um, uh, to the FTO glass. From there, go external to the circuit and come back to the other end, the counter electrode. At that point, we have a, what we call a redox reaction, whereby the triode dye will pick up that electron and convert into the iodide. dye. And they would, this iodide dye is going to carry the electron and then replenish the uh, oxidized dye. So that completes the whole process. Now, there are four deficiencies in this particular process in which it can be improved upon. First thing is, it limit, uh, there's only a limited harvesting light because the dye can only harvest a certain amount of light in a certain wave spectrum, as we'll see in a moment. The second thing is like uh, um, the light in which it harvests is, may not be completely trapped. It can be reflected, it can be transmitted. The third item is the electron has a, comp has a tendency to combine with the uh, oxidized dye, or maybe it can combine with the electrolyte, uh, or maybe get trapped at the interfaces. The last one is essentially um, the transport of ions is not terribly effective in the electrolyte. So we're going to look at um, four areas where nanofibers can be used to improve these four areas. First one is light harvesting. We typically use a, what we call N719, in which we would harvest the light from anything like a slightly less than 400 to 600 nanometers. Now, we use a second dye, what we call a copper PC. It's like a, uh, it has an inorganic and as well as organic compound, uh, component in which it can harvest the other uh, part of the light. So that when you add up all this, both of them, uh, you have a, this uh, so-called blue spectrum that covers a wider range. Now, we also arrange it in a very interesting way because the copper PC is chosen such that it's energetically higher level compared to N719. And we also put it in a very interesting manner. First of all, we do not use nanoparticles. We use nanofibers so that you have a one-dimensional highway rather than going from one particle to the next and having a lot of interfaces. Interfaces are bad because it would trap electrons. Um, what we would do is uh, we put the N719 and code as a monolayer on top of the nanofiber. And in addition to that, we call, put using CVD another shell of uh, copper PC on top of the uh, um, um, of, of the dye, of the uh, N719 dye, so that we have two shells and one core. And in fact, it has a, a structure like that. Okay? In this way, we would basically shield the TiO2 from the electrolyte. Um, now, in fact, with this particular process here, uh, we find out that we can improve the current um, by 41%. What is uh, interesting is the energy harvesting is uh, quite interesting because both the copper PC as well as the, uh, the N719 would harvest light. But the light that is harvested converted into electron, that electron, instead of directly passing to the TiO2, it would pass to the first dye. And then the dye, uh, with that energy, together with um, the energy it harvested, both collected, would pass to the TiO2. So this is what we call an energy cascade process. Much, much more effective compared to uh, if the, um, uh, the, the, the two would basically pass the uh, electron directly to the TiO2. Well, as a result, um, the PCE increased by almost 50% from the baseline level. Now, the second technology is interesting. 
other than using um, TiO2 60 nanometer diameter to harvest uh, the light, we also want to trap the light. We basically produce a second layer of nanofibers with a larger diameter, about 100 nanometers, so that when the light comes in, basically the light will bounce around and then uh, ultimately got trapped by, uh, uh, by the nanofibers and thereby we can harvest all uh, the light being uh, transmitted to the, to the solar cell. Now, an interesting challenge is typically photo annual thickness is about 10 microns, okay? If you two put too small amount of the reflective dye or the so-called larger nanofiber in there, um, it is not effective. If you put a very thick layer in there, it would take away the light harvesting layer. So you have to optimize. So to that regard, we have done an experiment in which we uh, use the EQE. Um, basically, this is like looking at efficiency at every wavelength. We find out that without the, the um, the scattering layer, we are here, but when we start adding the scattering layer, we find that there's a peak in which it occurs, and now afterwards, um, later on, uh, it would uh, be reduced again. And in this particular case, uh, this is about 10 nanometer, uh, 10 micron uh, photo anode. Um, so if you plot PCE against the, this so-called ratio R, where R is the scattering layer thickness to the total layer thickness, um, this uh, optimal condition occur at one seventh, and this is for the um, nine micron uh, photo anode thickness. If you go to a thinner uh, photo anode, about uh, maybe five microns, you find that this optimal ratio will be reduced. In fact, uh, an interesting aspect is you can see that uh, for this particular case, the R is equal to one six. And as a matter of fact, this particular increase in uh, improvement for thinner photo anode is actually much more better compared to a thicker photo anode. Because if you have a thicker photo anode, the light would be trapped anyway. But if you have a, use a thinner photo anode where it's even more transparent, that scattering layer is very important to help to uh, harvest the rest of the light. In fact, uh, this paper has been highly uh, cited and then uh, because we use a double layer of, of um, nanofibers uh, for, um, for the uh, dye sensors, dye solar cells. This was published about eight years ago. Now, a third technology we have done is after we um, harvest the light, we want to uh, convert this electron and put this electron back in the circuit. And the electron, as I said, is typically would get lost. So what we would like to do is like, um, uh, if we use the electron to travel along the nanofiber, it can only be used by diffusion and, and hopping because it's a semiconductor anyway. It's not a very effective way. What about putting carbon material inside that nanofibers? So we insert a CNT inside the uh, nanofibers. People have tried various ways of doing uh, CNT, but uh, however, they all have the CNT exposed so that it is ineffective. How do we do that? These are the CNT with diameter about um, 10 nanometers, and this is uh, basically um, uh, um, the end um, product whereby we have the CNT inserted into the nanofibers. Uh, well, if you look at a, a closer look, you can see the nanofiber is not smooth. It has also various kinds of crystallites on the surface. The crystallite is about 10 nanometers. Increase the large surface area where the dye can be absorbed uh, onto it. Uh, Again, uh, the question is, how much CNT should we put in there? And then uh, again, it comes back to the optimization. If you put too little CNT, it's not effective. If you put too much to it, during the calcination process, it would explode it, and then the CNT would come out and basically would compete with the dye um, on that site. So again, you would see an optimal condition. That optimal condition corresponds to 0.1% CNT in the precursor solution. But if you look at how much is actually in the nanofibers, it's about a few percent. So that's pretty much like a, the optimal for the, uh, the carbon material in there. So again, you can see that uh, uh, there's a, like an optimization. With that particular case, uh, we get 10%. And this was actually a work being published in um, advanced materials going back uh, six years ago, okay? So today, I mean, um, um, or, or at that point, um, the best um, PCE was about 12%. Today, it's about 14%. Um, okay, one other uh, technology which we use uh, for um, dye sensitized solar cells is we talk about all this photo anode, but what about in the electrolyte? In the electrolyte, we use uh, iodide and triiodide as a combination. 
Uh, what we want to do is um, people have put in various kinds of salt to improve the conductivity. But we tried something else. What we did is we put in open-end graphene nanotube, which are homemade. If you look at this uh, graphene um, nanotube, they're open-end and then they're hollow. And they are large enough to have uh, transported ions. Essentially, um, you are seeing that this is uh, like a, a, a positive, a cathode, and this is minus. So um, under the, uh, those um, conditions, uh, both the iodide and triodide would move to, towards the cathode. Okay? But if we put in a GNT in there, it actually would speed up uh, the movement of the ions. The, the model is quite complicated because it also involves double layer, etc. But what is interesting is once we have accumulation of the uh, iodine and triodide, the triodide would take place in a redox reaction. It would generate more iodide. When you have more iodide here uh, from the redox reaction together with the transport, essentially you have a back diffusion in which uh, the uh, iodide would uh, diffuse back. But the diffusion also takes place uh, with the GNT, okay? And we have done some separate experiments, which I have, don't have time in here, in which we verify both uh, using an electrokinetic phenomenon for the movement of ions over here, and also back diffusion um, uh, back, and both of which is facilitated by the GNT. In fact, uh, here is an uh, experiment which we have conducted, and uh, then in which you see the PCE as a function of various amount of uh, GNT in there. Again, if you put too little GNT in there, it's not effective. If you put too much in there, it will basically short circuit the whole thing from the, <laughs> from the anode all the way to the cathode. So you can, you can see, obviously, that's an optimal amount of uh, uh, carbon. In fact, this represents the optimi optimization. OK, let's move on to another uh, solar cell, the perovskite solar cell. The perovskite solar cell, in the past five years, is the most actively worked on because Again, uh, the fact that uh, um, it has a very high performance, and then uh, today the performance is uh, like a 22%. If you put a tandem arrangement, it goes to 24%. It basically competes with the amorphous silicon solar cells. So in this particular uh, uh, case here, uh, just give you a very quick introduction. The perovskite itself is a very complicated animal. Um, it has an organic component, a methyl ammonium group, and then uh, it has also eight other structures. Each of this structure here has lead and also together with six atoms of halide. Halides are the uh, chloride, bromide, iodide, etc. It's extremely effective to harvest the light. Now, in this perovskite layer, it's being sandwiched between the uh, electron uh, transport layer, the whole transport layer, and also um, the electrode. Here is the uh, direction where the light comes from. So what we have done was like in this particular perovskite layer, we put in graphene nanofibers. These are homemade graphene nanofibers uh, through exofoliation. The diameter of that is about 130 nanometers. And uh, from the Raman analysis using the characteristic DP, G peak, and then 2D peak, you can confirm exactly uh, the presence of uh, carbon in there. And um, interesting aspect is you would ask, what is the function of this graphene nanofibers? Because nobody has ever tried to interrupt a perovskite layer. It has two functions. The first function is it's used for seeding as well as uh, uh, crystallization. This is quite new because crystallization. How do we get this concept? Essentially, you have uh, um, this surface uh, formed by the nanofibers, and it, uh, it will become like a, a, a provide a large area, a large specific area for crystallization, for seed and crystallization. Once the crystal sit onto it, it becomes grow bigger and bigger. And then smaller crystal will grow onto the bigger crystals. In fact, during the curing process, we stop the curing process. Um, this is what we have seen. Um, you cannot see the nanofibers. What you can see, this whole area is basically the core, the larger crystals. And on outside, these are the smaller crystals. After you cure the whole thing, you form very, very large, gigantic, so-called, I call gigantic, crystals and uh, of high quality. These are over one microns. Uh, and again, in a, a few of uh, perovskite uh, solar cells, this is considered large. And then how large is large? You compare one without having uh, this technology. You can see the bottom picture is the control without the graphene nanofibers. So, and then in fact, um, with these large crystals here, you can see the EQE as a function of the wavelength. First of all, without those um, graphene, we can see that we have an excellent um, EQE, about 90% um, 
for a wide um, spectrum range from anywhere from 300 nanometers all the way up to 800 nanometers. Once we add uh, this technology in there, um, the performance go to 95%, also very uniform. This is excellent for harvesting the light. Now, the second function of that, you would have guessed uh, what, what the graphene is going to do. Essentially, electrons being generated is going to be transported instead of inside the, um, um, the crystal perovskite, it will be transported to the center graphene nanofibers. Okay? Uh, we have done uh, what we call an IMPS measurement to uh, measure the transport time. And then you can see the transport time is here plot against a uh, different condition. One's control, and then uh, the other case is for uh, putting various amount of graphene in there. Um, for the control case, is, this is measured in so-called microseconds. Uh, we find that a different kind of uh, amount of graphene we put in there, uh, uh, essentially um, uh, the transport time changes. There's an optimal amount in which uh, we have the least uh, transport time. And this is almost half of that of the control. But an interesting aspect, if you will overlay the PCE on top on the same graph and it's reading on this scale, you find out that this least transport also corresponds to the maximum point of the power conversion efficiency, showing that the graphene is fully responsible for the transport time. In fact, uh, we published a paper last year in which uh, this particular solar cells can achieve 20%. The world record is about 20 something percent, but again, it's with very careful experiment. I think it's beyond what the poly you can offer. But then I think with a good lab, you can, like for example here, you can certainly get much, much higher performance. You can also see very nice shape curve, a rectangular shape, showing a very, very strong field factor, field factor meaning low recombination rate. Now, one other interesting item was, um, so far when we put in the graphene nanofibers, we don't know how the graphene nanofibers uh, work inside the perovskite layer. But what about if we can engineer the crystal so that we would like the crystals to be a certain size? So we actually uh, electrospin nanofibers onto it into a line structure so that they are more rectangular. They are not quite exactly rectangular, but they are somewhat rectangular in a very thin layer, very large pores. So if this is a structure, in fact, this nanofibers is just purely TiO2. Okay, if you think about um, uh, crystals start forming from the, uh, from the surface of the nanofibers, you can see that actually um, uh, crystals are going to form from all, all phases, so that it start forming crystals, etc. So this is, uh, um, this is uh, the, the next picture of that, so more crystals. This is all due to modeling. This is, in fact, the actual crystals after it's being formed. So we used to take this model and look at um, uh, how the crystal size is, uh, compared to the actual crystal, we basically uh, make a plot in which we look at the frequency versus different crystal size. And then uh, one is the uh, true crystal size and the other is coming from this model. You can see, in fact, it works very well, showing that, in fact, we can engineer the crystals. But we are not, still not happy with that because the crystals can harvest the light. But what about the electron transport? So what we have done is uh, another trick. What we have done was like uh, we put in graphene nanofibers into the, uh, uh, into, we put in a, gra a graphene inside the nanofibers so that we can also help in uh, the transport. Again, similar to what we have seen uh, last, uh, in our last slide, uh, we can see that the transport time, the minimum here corresponds to the maximum of uh, the PCE. So again, the PCE uh, reached very close to 20%. And the amount of uh, carbon that you put in, uh, the maximum performance really depends on the situation. So for this particular case, it's about 5% of uh, uh, the graphene. This, again, in the uh, precursor solution. It's not like a, in the actual situation. OK, so much for the solar cells. Let's take nanofibers into the environment. OK, let's just look at filtration. Uh, five years ago, I was asked to go to Beijing to give a uh, plenary speech on pollution. And when I look outside my uh, hotel window, this is like that. I don't have to explain to the audience that what is pollution, because pollution is a, uh, one part of the daily life. Today, if you go to Beijing, there are times in which you can see blue sky. But in the winter time, it's still like that. Now, pollution has two parts. One is aerosols, and then the other is harmful gas. And people have heard about so-called PM2.5, OK? I mean, if I ask any students, they say, oh, I know what PM2.5 is, 2.5 micron and below. But it's measured by mass, OK? But what I've been working on 15 years ago without knowing some of this stuff is I start, when I 
um, left US back to Hong Kong. I said, why don't we have the blue sky as when we were a kid? And I realized that it was a, a, all due to this stuff. I will start working on PM.1. PM.1, not PM2.5. So this is what I've been working on in the past 25 years. I call it nano aerosols. I got a number of publications. I call it in the word nano aerosols. And in fact, these are what we call invisible killer because they're very small. In fact, the origin of emission comes from, from much, much finer stuff coming from diesel emission. And as the particles come together uh, under 100 nanometers, they will agglomerate, they will grow bigger. The PM.1 does not contribute by mass to the PM2.5, but the concentration is enormous. I just want to show you a picture of this nano aerosols. This is not my work, but this work here was, was scheduled. We breathe in the air in this room and outside. You would hardly find out that, in fact, this is the capillary that lines up in the human lung. Okay? Inside this particular capillary, around the cells around the uh, capillary, you can find out the, in the endothelial cells like a nanoparticle 81 nanometers. Because they are so small, we breathe them in, they go through the alveoli membrane, they go in the bloodstream, and then they, they are being carried. This is the next picture that goes into the red blood cells uh, that is inside this capillary that will carry to different parts of organs. There's been an extensive study uh, by uh, Health Effects Institute in uh, Boston. They, uh, um, they, they basically show a number of different pathways, how these so-called nano aerosols, sometimes called the ultra-fine particles, would get into the cardiovascular uh, respiratory uh, part and also the brain causes uh, brain uh, effects, okay? So, I mean, like a BCCD, sometimes people go cuckoo because of this long-term effect. Again, uh, a lot of this has uh, not been completely quantified, but then uh, this is very, uh, unfortunately, uh, very bad. The other thing is, let's step aside and look at viruses, okay? Don't think about exotic stuff like Hong Kong SARS, going back to 2003, or Merck's in the Middle East, or even uh, bird flu, swine flu in China, etc. Think about common cold. All these viruses, what do you think about the particle size? They are all in the nano aerosol range. 50 to 100 nanometers. So it doesn't matter. In the air, you have viruses, you have uh, 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 pollutant particles. Now, let's look at how these pollutant particles are being captured, going back to basic 101 filtration. This is our fiber, a cross section of a fiber, and then this is a cartoon picture showing like a, a particle can be carried by the streamline and intercept by the, part, by the fiber, we call interception. There are other, um, other, other, other particles that go kind of randomly what we call diffusion or Brownian motion. They can go and capture at the back side or the leeward side of the of fiber. There are other particles that can go um, uh, deviate from the streamline and captured by the fiber. But this particle here usually is bigger than one micron. I'm not interested in that because for nano aerosol, they have absolutely no, uh, uh, no play in the capture mechanism. Diffusion and interception are very important. Let's think of a, a thought experiment. You take a fiber like three microns, okay? And these are the nano aerosols. First of all, if you look at this picture, something is wrong. Size-wise, you have small fish, you have a big net. But if you take this fiber and then reduce the diameter to one-tenth, so there's a 0.3 micron. So you can start seeing size-wise, is they're comparable. But in doing that, you make 100 fibers of the same length. But then the surface area does not increase by 100 times. By geometry, it only increased 10 times. Even that increase in uh, 10 times in the surface area can enhance the diffusion for particles less than 100 nanometers and for particles bigger than 100 nanometers. This is, in fact, the basis of nanofibers. You want to use the small nanofibers to capture the, the nano aerosols. Uh, we have simulated the nano aerosols in our lab using sodium chloride, using aeration of sodium chloride. We can actually generate a lot higher concentration than what we need from 40 nanometers to 500 nanometers. These are the efficiency as a function of different particle size in a log scale. There are five different sets of uh, experiments correspond to from a small amount of nanofibers all the way to increasing nanofibers. In each set, look at something very interesting. About 100 nanometers, you can see this goes out this way. This is all due to diffusion. Whereas like a 
the other curve goes the other way, it's all to interception. So when they add up together or superimpose together, you've got a so-called smarty face, a V-shape. Now for each set, you have two sets of um, uh, data. One corresponds to low uh, uh, phase velocity and one goes to higher phase velocity. If you have higher phase velocity, that means there's less time for diffusion. That's why the performance is lower. But for interception, it makes no difference because the streamline doesn't change because it's still somewhat like a low Reynolds number flow. But an interesting aspect is uh, we also put in the uh, theoretical uh, comparison. It shows extremely well. So we understand that part. And you may ask, this is all laboratory stuff. What happens to real aerosols? In aerosol, real aerosol, recently in the past two years, we start measuring real aerosols. Real aerosols are extremely difficult to measure because these are fractal. These are not like a round shape. These are fractal dimensions, and also at the same time, they're irregular. They have all kinds of chemical composition onto it. And if you ask, uh, is that correct that uh, we have this kind of distribution? In fact, this is, uh, we have done some measurements repeatedly. At the same time, 6 p.m., when there were traffic uh, near our campus, which is very close to the Cross Harbor Tunnel, we found that the data are highly repeatable, even though it's so scattered. You can see all this plot here. This is the 100 nanometers. Below that is the nano aerosols. Again, we see a very large accumulation of nano aerosols. So whatever this is, in fact, reflect that. This we have done for the past 15 years. We only did the measurement in the past two years. Okay? And then we also put in our filters and measure the, uh, uh, the filters and see what is going on. In fact, you can see the shape. It looks very similar to that. Okay? And, uh, but unfortunately, most of the aerosols that we measure they are all nano aerosols, and diffusion takes a very important part. And the other thing is, if you plot the so-called single fiber efficiency, means like equivalent single fiber inside a nano fi in, in, inside a, a filter, uh, against the pallet number. Pallet number is a measure of the convection to diffusion. When the particle becomes very small, diffusion is extremely important. So the pallet number becomes uh, much smaller, so-called smaller is uh, around 10 and below. Usually, in the past, people work with a pallet number which is very large, so they don't see this diffusion. So diffusion is an extremely important element in here. Now, so far, it's all quantitative. What about qualitative? Okay. This picture shows that two different nano uh, microfiber filters. One is two micron fiber, the other is a 15 micron fiber. You can see um, we put the filter right at the uh, end of the tailpipe. You capture the diesel nano aerosols. You can see some version. I, can, I don't think so because it's, <laughs> they're so small. Okay? Uh, and we also see some agglomerates. Most of them are agglomerates, are much larger. Oh, you said, oh, they are pretty effective in capturing these particles. Wait until you see the next picture. The next picture shows you the nanofiber filter. Under the same condition, you said, oh, it captured a lot more. So the question you guys should ask yourself, what happens to the, the one on the left? That means they are not captured. If you wear a face mask in which you try to protect yourself from the pollutants, it doesn't protect you. It just goes right into your system. Okay? So it speaks to itself. It is dangerous, but I, I can see it, so I don't care. <laughs> but they accumulate over time, and then it causes problems. Because they are under exactly the same condition. And the reason why it's being captured is by diffusion and interception. OK, so I asked myself, and said, well, how come that I did not see nanofiber uh, filter product in the market? It is because nanofibers are non-woven. This is, you can see that if it's non-woven, there's a big problem. The problem is pressure drop. As you start putting more and more nanofibers, these are three pictures of uh, SEM showing uh, little nanofiber, more nanofiber, more nanofiber. The pore get smaller. That's what we thought, discussed at lunch. So if that's the case, that's one of the reasons why we have a large pressure drop. If, if you can, uh, uh, what, what good is it for excellent protection if it's a large pressure drop? But what we have done was we take the amount of nanofiber that's required to achieve a certain efficiency, we break it up into multiple thin layers, and each layer we support with a, a, a so-called screen material which, which has large porosity we introduce macro pore in an otherwise micro pore environment. With that arrangement, we find that the pressure drop can be much reduced. This is the experiment which we want to show you dem that demonstrate that effect. This is a 0.3 micron uh, as a function of pressure drop. 
okay? As you start putting more and more nanofibers originally uh, or initially, you have a linear increase, but afterwards you have a diminishing return. But if you break it up the way it is, you can see the curve, the other curve looks like that. Now, at one condition where we have a similar amount of nanofibers, but then we can have a big savings in pressure drop, you can actually uh, reduce the, um, the layer thickness uh, much more and produce more multiple layers. You have basically a quasi three dimensional filter because when you do electro spinning, most of them are two dimensional, two dimensional thing. So here we are trying to create a, what we call a free, quasi three dimensional pattern. Now, if you measure the so called efficiency versus pressure drop, which is essentially what we just uh, quality factors. It's essentially a benefit to cost ratio. With this arrangement of multi-layering, you can maintain this constant. But with the single layer, basically you have a reduction in the benefit to cost ratio. In fact, we have a number of patents on this. And then five years ago, uh, we have our license in technology. And today we are producing um, face mask. Uh, and we are uh, selling this through the, uh, a startup company. Uh, I can see, show this. I forgot to bring, bring out my toys. So they are selling um, this through the internet, okay? Even though I don't like the package, <laughs> because I, I feel that we can do a, I can do a little bit better than the, what they have done. But these are the nanofiber uh, face mask. And then um, a lot of times people say, okay, let me try and see what I wear it on. Okay, if you wear it on, you may not uh, be able to tell the difference, okay, whether it's good or bad. But we basically test that, so uh, um, on the real aerosols, and it's very effective. Okay, the other thing which we recently have tried was, what about putting electrical effect, okay, or electrostatic onto the nanofibers? Um, this little picture here that shows like a, we have a charged nanofibers. If you have two particles which are neutrally charged as they approach the nanofiber, very close to the nanofibers, there's an induction process in which a dipole is inducted on the particle. And then bigger particles have a bigger dipole moment compared to a smaller particle. And after that uh, induction, you start having a so-called interaction between the um, opposite charge and that result in a capture. Okay, well, the deficiency is uh, there are publication on that but most of them says within a, a few hours, the charge is gone, okay? So it doesn't make a difference, especially in the human environment. Um, I would uh, answer that question in a moment. Now, we plot the filter efficiency as a function of particle size. This is what the conventional microfiber uh, performance is, and then this is our nanofibers. Because the nanofibers are smaller in diameter, the electric field close to the nanofiber are a lot stronger, so it can provide the induction and also the capture. This is known as dielectrophoresis, a scary term, but then that's the basic term. So that's one of the reasons why uh, we have this kind of uh, performance. Also, you can look at the quality factor again, you can see something similar. This is a very important plot. What we have done was you take the same filter, we do it day one, capture efficiency as function of particle size. This is the uh, kind of a shape it looks like. Larger particles would have a, a larger dipole moment, would have better capture. We do it two weeks later, same performance. And we also do it uh, three months later, nine days later. It dropped by 1%. We do it in Hong Kong environment where we have 90% humidity and also high temperature. That's very important. That means 1% is not bad, okay? You have a shelf life of that. So that is pretty good. We can make uh, the nanofibers, charged nanofibers of different sizes, quite uniform, okay? From 80 to uh, 500 nanometers. Uh, early this year, uh, I had like a, a, a basically a news release. You can put it into the filter. You can uh, put it into a what we call viral mask. Viruses usually is negatively charged, okay? So this has a much, much more favorable to capture the viruses. So this is a very important product. We can also use it for topical drug release uh, where the drug can be attached to by electrostatic uh, uh, charges uh, onto the nanofibers and you put it onto the uh, as a face mask, and because of humidity, you will start slowly releasing re drugs, okay? You can also put it on topical on this. And then, in fact, um, uh, this can be also be used as a, what we call a transfer protein in the Western block. So that was like uh, the news release that we had uh, early in the year. Now, what about testing it on real aerosols? This is the equipment which we use or designed in our, our case to test that. We basically have a two double cones. In one case, we put a test filter, in this case, 
we do not have a filter, but both of them go through this, uh, the channel. Only one can operate at a, a given point in time. We draw the air in, and then uh, we go through uh, like a mobility uh, spectrometer to measure the, the size, okay? So in this case, if we go through this channel, that means it's almost simulating upstream. If you go through the filter, you always measure downstream. Based on upstream and downstream, you can measure the capture efficiency. So this is a real equipment. You can see the, the double cone in here. This is an interesting thing because you can really take the, your whatever you have developed and take it to the street and take it to different locations. I can take it over here and do the testing here. These are the uh, measurements uh, coming from that, okay, with different um, amount of nanofibers, mechanical capture, and this is with electrostatic because, uh, again, um, uh, the favorable condition at large particles. So we can certainly see that, um, again, we can get to a very high efficiency, but with the electrostatic, you do not add pressure drop. Uh, okay, so much for the face mask or um, light loading. What about for um, try to protect this room or maybe in your clean room, okay? In your clean room where you have the clean room 100, clean room 1000. Today, they use HEPA filter. So when they design this place, they need a huge pump, large pressure drop. Here we are trying to compete with that without pressure drop. What we have done is we understand the weakness of nanofiber. It's so small, much, much thinner, about maybe uh, 10 microns in thickness or 20 microns in thickness. So how can we compete with, uh, um, with other filters? What we have done was we put a microfiber layer on top of that or upstream of that to make a composite filter. And in fact, a cake would actually form on the surface of nanofiber as well as on the microfiber. But we would select the microfiber so that the cake on the microfiber would outweigh uh, the cake on the nanofiber. The way uh, the cake on the microfiber is a lot more porous and less pressure drop. That, so that's the whole spirit. And I'll show you the results. Here's a pressure drop as a function of deposited mass on the filter. This may be take days and days of experiment from my students. Okay, with a nanofiber, you can see this is a pressure ex uh, excursion. But with a, a composite filter, you can see initially you have a little higher pressure drop, but ultimately it has a much lower pressure drop. So the kick here is much more uh, porous compared and permeable compared to a nanofiber. And in fact, at this particular condition of 20 grams per square meters, we have a 30% reduction. Imagine you can use a pump 30% less power because uh, power is pressure drop times flow rate. So you can have much, much better performance. Now, what about, uh, do you, can you recycle that? You can actually clean a nanofiber filter. Imagine your mom asks you to clean your, your vacuum uh, filter back. Okay, what do you do? You take that filter back and bump against uh, the wall and to shake it out. Essentially, that was, that's what we do. After you load up the filter, we stop and we apply the uh, air from the back. So what we do is uh, we apply pulses to it. It's like a providing inertia to basically detach the cake from the filter surface. And afterwards, we blow it out. So we put this all together. And then I just want to show you the process. This is a six cycles of loading and cleaning, loading and cleaning. In this particular process, this is pressure drop against operating time. Uh, you see the first loading, cleaning, it does not restore back to the original position because there's some residual uh, aerosol trapped inside. So you continue on that until this residual increases. At some point, you have to stop and then throw away the filter. But this is what the process is. We have done some modeling, and I don't have time to go into it. But these are the uh, different cycles of uh, 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 loading. We can actually predict uh, very well what's happening, and it has to do with the skin and other things, which again is uh, quite involved. Okay, let me move on to the next topic. The next topic is not aerosols. The other stuff is harmful gas. In this room, there's formaldehyde. There's other VOC. We ourselves produce VOC too. Perfume is part of VOC. <laughs> okay, sorry, ladies. So um, let's just go back at basis 101. What is photocatalysis? Typically, people use a TiO2. Okay, TiO2 has like a, 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 a band uh, energy. Uh, a band gap of 3.2 electron volt. Under sunlight, electrons get excited uh, to the conduction band, and then both the electron is going to combine with the oxygen in the air to form uh, superoxide, whereas the whole combine with the water vapor to form the hydroxyl radical. Deficiency. Typically, TiO2 only uh, harvests UV light. UV light is only uh, 5% of the entire spectrum. So what we have done is we put in a little bit about uh, other semiconductors, very, very small amount, bismuth, zinc, etc. So we put in additional barriers so that 
the uh, separate electron and hole, they are separate. But again, they need to be in the right energy band. And not only that, we put in graphene into it so that we are able to uh, ship out the um, ship out the, uh, um, the electrons. And one of the interesting aspects, which I will have to borrow uh, this sheet here, people, a lot of people work on graphene sheets, okay? So graphene is excellent for electron transport. And electron can transport around in the four edges of this graphene sheet. But have you ever asked yourself a question? What happens if electron come to the edge of the graphene sheet? Where does the electron go? Fall off the cliff, combine the hole. So what we have done was, we take this graphene sheet, we roll it up so that we eliminate the edge. We make it like this, okay? So electron travel, travel, travel. There's no edge, doesn't see edge. It can only go this way. We take this graphene sheet, we insert it in, into the uh, uh, nanofibers. Thank you. And then we produce a new material. This is the material we produce. Um, we have uh, um, the nanofiber, which is made of TiO2, bismuth, and zinc. These are all crystallized. Okay, inside is this graphene sheet. And you can see in the uh, TEM picture, the graphene sheet with the, uh, uh, I mean, the nanofiber, TiO2, nano, composite nanofiber with the graphene inside, the diameter is only 80 nanometers. It's only 1,000 times of a typical normal hair, okay? And uh, this has wonderful properties, a lot of wonderful properties. One of the interesting properties, uh, because of this TCB, what we call TCBG, uh, it can harvest um, more than UV light, okay? In the UV as well as visible spectrum, um, um, it's much better than uh, without the graphene, and it's much better than just by itself. We have tested on NOx, nitrogen oxide. We convert the NO to NO2, and if we use the so-called the best TiO2 nanoparticles, which is called P25, it's 18 nanometers in diameter. We can only convert 9%. Now, if you use a TCB, okay, with a little bit of zinc and bismuth in the TiO2 nanofibers, we can convert four times higher. If you use a TCB with various amount of uh, graphene inside, we can produce uh, as much as 70%, or se sorry, seven times more, 70 compared to 9%, so it's a seven times more. We can also work with formaldehyde. This is one of the major elements on new buildings, retrofit, furnitures, you all have formaldehyde. Some formaldehyde can make you headache, can make, make you very sick. With uh, just a P25, we can convert 25%, TCB 50% double. With a, a TCBG, various kinds of uh, graphene, we can con convert three times more. In the past year, we got something very excited on the technology, whereby nanofibers are very brittle. You cannot put the nanofiber here because, and the nanofibers will be gone. And when they're gone, they can go, you can inhale into it, and you lose the nanofiber. It's not sustainable. We want to be sustainable. So what we did is we put it in a coating. We put it in a very thin coating. There's a one require, there are four requirements on this coating. Permeable to light, uh, permeable to gas pollutant molecules. They can dock onto it, and they go through oxidation, etc. We can also address uh, bacterial viruses and also water vapor. However, this is not permeable to water. It's hydrophobic. And it has also a photocatalytic function to it. So these are the requirements. And today, we actually can come up with such a coating. This is the coating which we are talking about. There's a very thin coating on the order of millimeter or so. Inside is a very nanofibers, OK? For example, um, you will hear me keep on saying about a seven by seven, because uh, this is a seven by seven uh, um, of glass. It has 10 milligrams of nanofibers. 10 milligrams is 0.01 gram. So it's not much uh, stuff in there, but it can do wonderful things, okay? We take this and put it into our test work. We find out that we can convert um, or, or break down um, this, uh, uh, formaldehyde, 66%, but uh, whereas with a P25, for the same coating, you only do 21%. TCB is only 45%. And in fact, um, showing you the previous uh, graph here, it has a similar shape, but this one only used 90 milligrams. This used only 10 milligrams. Not a lot of nanofibers involved. Now, you, you ask me, what about the coating? How uniform is the coating? So what we have done is our experiment 
instead of breaking it and trying to find out how much nanofiber is, I asked my student, why don't you uh, cover the, four, the rest of the three sides and do it systematically? That's what he did. Different position, OK? And then afterwards, uh, um, if one piece here gives you 67%, what if you think about them being in a series? So when you add them up in this particular way, you get 65% efficiency. And then this testing, this whole piece is 67%. Very interesting stuff. OK? And not only that, we also work on NOx, because uh, vehicles emit a lot of NOx. It's a very big, important problem uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, around the world. If you use the coating by itself, it doesn't do anything. If you put a P25, it do 20%. Uh, TCB, 29%, and TCBG, 41%. The other thing is, well, what happens if uh, you uh, like, uh, uh, use it many, many times? As I said, nothing comes out. It's sustainable. This is a, a, a piece of testing in which we, we take one of the tiles that's made nine months ago and we repeat the testing. Same performance, no change, OK? So nothing comes out. There's no nanomaterial being emitted, and you ask, why do, what do you call it? I said, whitewash. Why do you have whitewash? In fact, I showed this to some of the government agency. He asked all his guys to search what's a whitewash. I said, it's a whitewash. Because I went to the island in Greece and found all the houses are whitewash. I call it whitewash. And it has a very good name. And somebody, one of my students did paint this blue, OK, make it blue. And the blue color is like that. After a day, it's whitewash it becomes white because it has such a strong oxidation power that it oxidizes the color into white. It wash it out, white wash. So unfortunately, you have to work with white wash. You start with red, and you'll be white wash. Um, so you can put it on glass. You can put it on plastic, et cetera. Now, this is like an experiment showing um, efficiency as a function of different concentration of formaldehyde. And uh, you can take a continuous stream of formaldehyde at 1 ppm, very, very strong. 1 ppm of formaldehyde can make you extremely sick. Okay? Uh, you can go to the hospital, et cetera. And then after a few stages of this, using three of these tiles, you can reduce it down to less than 20 um, parts per billion or 0.02. And that is basically the room level of a, uh, a typical room. And um, what we did is like, uh, does it work outside the laboratory? We take eight of this and put it inside this unit. And we put a light on it, 100 watt LED light. And then we take a can of uh, a paint, OK? We, uh, we spray the, the whole box in, um, with, um, uh, with the paint. It has a lot of VOC, but we measure formaldehyde. So we have produced various kinds of level of uh, uh, impossible uh, beating of uh, formaldehyde. But after we normalize this with the initial concentration, we find within five minutes, the level drops to one-tenth of the original level. After another five minutes, we drop to the residual level of what Rome is, 20 parts per billion. So this is an excellent uh, way in which uh, we can actually set up a, a whole array of LED light and shine onto whitewash. This is like a, a device we made. Uh, this is a, 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 the new generation air purifier. No, air, I mean, this, some, some of these machines here are very ex expensive uh, in Hong Kong, OK? Especially um, here, this, you're talking about not activate carbon. You're not talking about ionizer. You're not talking about other things. So uh, it is, you can actually integrate this in, together with the LED design. In fact, um, in one particular test, instead of measuring the formaldehyde, you want to measure the total VOC. And then uh, instead of measuring like uh, in parts per billion, we measure in parts per million ppm, extremely high level. Okay? You can see the how fast how, uh, uh, the, the so-called decrease of uh, the uh, so-called uh, VOC level, a thousand times more. And in fact, you can use this as a window shade. If this is a window, you harvest the light, um, the window shade has a little gap with the window. And then um, basically, this area is heated up. So you have a buoyancy, you have a natural convection. So this becomes a self-circulation. But at the same time, the light it harvests can break down uh, the, uh, the pollutants, and also it breaks down uh, um, the harmful gas. And one thing which I found very interesting is this guy here can also harvest IR, infrared, anywhere from 900 to 100. 
1,500 nanometers. So it can actually shield you from the heat. If you imagine like a, your tourist bus have the window shade all made of this, you feel cooler, you feel, you feel the air is a lot more fresher. Okay, not only that, we can also use in water because, I mean, uh, this is not free catalyst. It can be put into the water. In the, in the water, we can break down the organics. There are a lot of organics in the, in the water. Um, if you wash your vegetables, it have the herbicide washout. You, that's one of the organics. If you are working close to a pharmaceutical company, they have a lot of waste water. I mean, inside are all kinds of organics. You can break down organics. We have done experiments using um, rotamine uh, B, and you can see the P25, TCB, and TCBG. Uh, again, you can see much, much better performance with our uh, TCBG. Uh, uh, oh, I missed this. This is with methylene blue, also a standard dye. Again, you will see a, a very good performance. These are free catalysts. In the case of free catalysts, after the experiment, you have to try to uh, 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 filter it out. Extremely difficult to recover that. But if you use uh, this piece, a 7x7, nothing is uh, going with the water. Everything is all contained. And organics attached to this would be able to be broken down into smaller uh, elements. Uh, you can see again very good performance of that. The other thing which we found out was disinfection. Disinfection, you can also, by photocatalytic means, you can actually uh, oxidize uh, the bacteria, uh, pun puncture a hole into the bacteria and the bacteria die. In fact, um, there are all kinds of mechanisms here. One is basically physical, whereby the sharp edge of the graphene uh, inside the um, nanofiber can actually puncture a uh, hole in the bacteria. The other one is um, because of photooxidation, it can generate all kinds of what we call reactive uh, oxygen species. I've mentioned a little bit, a few uh, earlier on, and also maybe transfer of electron to the, to the bacterial membrane and causes uh, physiological stress that again can kill the bacteria. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff into it. We have done a very extensive experiment in the lab uh, by using cell culture, it takes a long of time. We actually put in um, bacteria, which is 30 times more than the most dirtiest public toilet. You know, some of the ladies here, they're so hygienic, in which uh, when they open and close the door, they use a tissue to open and close the door. Now you don't have to do that. You can, what you can do is like a, you can put it into this like a place where you can push the door or maybe pull the door. Uh, if you are inside the um, toilet, where you have to turn it, you can coat this onto it, and, and then you save that basically bacterial dye. Okay. So in conclusion, um, we have done the work of dye sensitized solar cell. The nanofiber can be used as a photocatalyst, provide effective light harvest, light trapping, and also transport of electrons and ions. In the perovskite solar cells, it can be good, used for nucleation, crystallization, and also uh, charge transport. Uh, in the air filter, depending on light and heavy loading, we've seen uh, uh, multi-layering in reducing pressure drop while maintaining high uh, efficiency. And also, we have also add electrical, electrostatic charges onto it, which improve the performance without having an increase in pressure drop. In the case of heavy loading, we put in a microfiber filter in it. Uh, we form a cake based on a microfiber filter, and uh, we have a low pressure drop all, all along uh, the entire loading process. In the air water purification, with photocatalytic effect, we can uh, harvest the light, reduce the recombination, and also improving uh, charge transport, especially with the uh, conductive graphene. With the TCBG, we can have a fast degradation and conversion of all that stuff uh, in the water, breaking down the methylene blue and also uh, various kinds of organics. The whitewash can be used indoor and as well as outdoor because it's cleanable. I mean, nothing is consumed. And not only that, we actually, um, as I said, is we create a new material based on two known materials. One is a semiconductor nanofiber, the other is graphene. But when we combine this in a very interesting way, we actually have a, what we call graphene inside. Remember 10 years ago, when you buy a computer, it's an Intel inside. So here, I'm proud to say that we have graphene inside our nanofibers after 10 years, okay? Uh, it can be used in a number of different things. In fact, uh, I'm, I'll be interested to explore with um, any of you who are exploring with various kinds of things, uh, including areas in solar cells and photocatalysts, there are areas in which I, I have not done on it on, on sensors, but again, there are materials and application in which requires a material that has semiconductor properties together with a highly conductive materials. 
With that, I'd like to uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Uh, I never knew so many applications could be. I don't know that either. Uh, uh, questions, comments, as comments? By the way, these are taken on the campus yesterday. Oh, I, I was going to ask, is it Hong Kong? <laughs> no, it's not Hong Kong. It was taken on the campus yesterday. Not today, today. Thank you, Wallace, for that very nice talk. Actually, I was in Beijing together with you in 2014 when we were giving the talk at the same time. That's when we first met. Oh, I see. <laughs> Sorry. My memory. Anyway. Yeah, my memory. Yeah. Uh, great talk. I always enjoy the talk, uh, speaking in the audience. I have a couple of questions. Um, you mentioned electrospinning. Yes. Uh, seems like all your samples were made by electrospinning. Yeah, all my samples are done by electrospinning. Uh, there are other ways to make nanofibers. Yes, there are other ways. reason you choose electrospinning over others? No, I did not. Uh, I just, um, whatever comes to oh. hand. In fact, um, again, I'm very glad you bring up that point because regardless how you make your nanofibers uh, using uh, other uh, uh, solution methods uh, uh, other than electrospinning, because what I'm focusing on is mainly the application of the, of the fibers in as much as how to produce it. If you have a better way to produce more quantities, that would be excellent because uh, okay, so, yeah. that's an important aspect. So that's, not the, that's not what you're going after anyway, right? Yes, so, like, yes. So can, can you help us understand the materials behind your nanofiber? You use all kinds of nanofibers. What kind of materials are they made of? As I said, it's like uh, for the case of filter, you typically use uh, orga organic material, polymeric material. Use, uh, we use a PEO, uh, polyethylene oxide. We use a nylon six. We use a PVDF. Uh, we use a PVA. And then I'm sure there are any materials that can find a solvent and then we can make it into like a honey shape. We can use it to spin. Now for um, solar cells and also for the catalysis, in which is inorganic, we typically make it out from a uh, um, a precursor of titanium dioxide. Uh, we add in a small amount of other semiconductors, um, either mostly N-type, we also have add in P-type, and to make it into functional. The whole thing is like uh, you need to find out exactly the energy band uh, uh, if it's uh, uh, related to uh, like a photonic uh, application. And also we, um, in, uh, we also make out natural materials like hydrogen, or uh, for other things. Um, so again, you can make anything that you want to. Thank you. Mm. Uh, thank you a lot for this very, very impressive talk you know, about the uh, different type of application you developed. Uh, probably they work very well because I noticed last spring that the uh, pollution level in Beijing was much more lower than previous years. So yeah. that means your products were... I see better. the blue sky, yeah. <laughs> very, very good. Yeah. Uh, I have a question regarding what you call the graphene nanotube. So what is the difference with what is was usually called the paper roll carbon nanotubes? So uh, the graphene nanofibers. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of paper roll or spiral carbon nanotube or are they different in the types of? Yes, they are they, they, they're different. And one thing I did not mention is how we produce these are all homemade. Um, essentially, uh, we use um, Exfoliation of graphene, graphite to produce graphene sheets. After the graphene sheets, we put in a dispersant in there to keep the graphene from agglomerating. And afterwards, we put in centrifugation. One of my expertise I've been doing is in the past 30 years, I'm an expert in centrifugation. So we centrifuge it. By centrifuging it, we control the size and also the amount in which we can put into this graphene. So after we control the amount, we take the supernatant and put into electro spinning. Okay. Why is Paula who is the professor regarding to the graphene uh, tube or graphene down small? Um, I read some paper that actually using some catalysts like the uh, iron, iron oxide to, iron oxide. to rolling this up. So I'm not sure in your uh, mechanical wise, what's the triggering force to make the graphene sheets rolling? Second, it's uh, regarding to the uh, removing the VOC. Um, have you considering the environmental condition, for example, like uh, humidity, to the effect of that? Okay, let me answer the first one. Okay. 
um, in our electro spinning, we have um, um, when you, you think about electro spinning, it, you think about the graphene. The graphene is just like a, maybe a loose sheet of a handkerchief or a cold handkerchief. Okay, when, once uh, it is under so called very strong electrostatic field, um, it will be sucked in there. If you have a, like a, a other stuff like a TiO2 and then or maybe a, other polymer, they would most likely be in the shell, and then the graphene would be the inside. In fact, the graphene also helps electrospinning spinning because it provides a conductance element, very important. Okay. Uh, now, second question is like a humidity. Regarding to the removal, like a, for example, formaldehyde, are we considering the humidity or temperature? Yes. Very, a very interesting question. Um, there's something which I didn't show. Um, if maybe if I show. The humidity here, the humidity provides the, um, the, you see the, uh, the hydrogen um, or the hole. Let me just, let me show you one slide here in which it might answer the question you have. Okay, this is the slide. This is a slide. Uh, you see, um, basically this is a photocatalyst. This is a formaldehyde. And then there are two parts in here. One is the uh, so-called um, superoxide, and this is a hydroxide. The hydroxide was formed because of water vapor combined with the hole, combined with the hole here to form this hydroxide radical. Both of them can actually break down uh, this uh, so-called formaldehyde uh, into CO2 and H2O. If you have just like a, a, a very low or very high uh, humidity environment, they're not very effective. If you're working about maybe 40 to 60% humidity, they provide an optimal source of the water vapor to form the hydroxyl group, okay? Uh, if you are only working uh, without hydroxyl group, then you rely primarily on the superoxide to do the conversion, okay? So the performance is less. And you can actually, we have done a lot of tests on that as well. So any more questions? Did I get you guys all lost? Well, there will be an opportunity also as we sure. have some after the talk. So let me thank the, the Wallace with the uh, token of appreciation from Wen, uh, if you can carry with you. And okay. most importantly, we have you. Oh, maybe I have to take a picture. In our <laughs> Hall of Fame permanently as well. So this will be done uh, on, at least uh, yes, uh, opposite to your and office. This is Thank for you. you to keep, and we'll have you permanently in our wall as well. All right, I'm going to say that you like. <laughs> okay, thank you very thank much. You, thank you, thank you. And again, I'd like to thank all of you for inviting me over. I really uh, appreciate it for all the comments that you have, and it will help me keep on thinking on my way home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.